The basic mission for the British Canadian Airborne was to secure the left or eastern flank of the invasion. To do that, they had several targets to hit. Five bridges on the River Deve, seven miles east of the landings, were to be destroyed. A gun battery at Merville, five miles from Sword Beach, had to be taken out. And the bridges at Benneville and Ronville to be captured intact. The airborne were to be reinforced by the commandos landing on Sword Beach, who were to hold the ridge near Bal The first action on D-Day was capturing the bridges, one of which is now called Pegasus Bridge. I've already made a video about that, so we'll concentrate on the other missions. The 6th Airborne Division landed in three drop zones called N, V and K. The first drops were at midnight 50, mainly paratroopers and some gliders. At 3.20, gliders landed in drop zone N near Ranville to bring in equipment and men. At 2100 hours, 250 gliders came in to land on landing zone W, west of the Orn. Those 250 gliders, towed by 250 C-47s and accompanied by 50 C-47s to drop bundles, crossed the coast near Luxeur-Mer around 9pm. By good luck, that was just as Colonel Rock, with tanks of the 192nd Panzer Regiment, arrived at the coast in the gap between Sword and Juno. Those 550 aircraft convinced Rock to turn back to Khan. The 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion landed as part of the 3rd Parachute Brigade in Drop Zone V. The mission was to control Varaville to protect the eastern side of Drop Zone V and blow the bridge at Varaville over the Devet. They were also to destroy the bridge at Rubberham. Many men were dropped far off course or in the floods. Sometimes, as the jump of a stick was interrupted by the plane manoeuvring, Pilots would go round in a circle to get to what they thought was the same position, to drop the rest of the men. They rarely got to the same place, so sticks were broken up. A Sergeant Kelly got caught in a tree over the floods. His feet were caught in the risers and his head was in the water. With 80 pounds of equipment on, it took all his strength to get his head out of the water to breathe before going under again. He was about to surrender to his fate when some paratroopers freed him. Lieutenant Colonel Otway landed in Drop Zone V. His mission was to knock out Merville Gun Battery, which had four guns trained on Sword Beach. The plan was for 650 men to launch a three-pronged attack as three gliders landed inside the battery, after seeing a signal flare fired by Otway. In 1944, there was a tree here on the eastern end of Drop Zone V, and that was a rendezvous point for Otway and his men. Now, when he had got here, he had 110 men, should have been 650. Now, he waited an extra 15 minutes uh, till 2.35. He'd uh, included that 15 minutes in secretly for this uh, eventuality. And another 40 turned up, so he had 150. And uh, he wondered if he should go ahead, but he realised he had to. And so they set off to Gonneville where they're going to meet the pathfinders who'd been making the paths through the minefield and seeing what the defences were like at the Merville Battery. Now the attack on Merville Battery merits a video on its own, so that would be the subject of another video. So tap subscribe and give us a like and the bell as well as subscribe to be kept notified of the next videos. Behind me is the town of Varaville. And that's when McGowan had set up a defence position around the church. And just behind us here is the gatehouse to the chateau. Major Murray McLeod was one of the few men to land in the right place, in the drop zone V, which is over the other side of the chateau. As they were coming towards the rendezvous point, bombers that should have bombed Mervyn Battery bombed the drop zone. And uh, McLeod was quite badly hurt suffering from a severe concussion and abdominal and chest pains. 
He carried on and explained to the men how C Company was going to carry out its mission. The mission was to destroy a guardhouse, destroy the bridge in Varaville, and the artillery HQ, which was stationed here at the chateau. Trouble is, he only had 16 men. Now, Lieutenant Madden's mission was to take the bridge. He was the other side of the River Orne, that's 10 miles away, that way. The only other officer he had was Lieutenant Walker. McLeod sent Sergeant Davis and one man to try and blow up the bridge down there, and Lieutenant Walker and two men to knock out some machine gun positions at Puttyville. That way, that left 11 men to take the chateau. So they carried on towards the chateau. Luckily, they found another six men on the way. So they now had 17. They came through the chateau, which is behind the gatehouse. The chateau showed chimes of occupation, but it was empty. Then they got to the gatehouse, inspected the beds here. Now, with the beds of the chateau and the beds here, he counted 96 men in the garrison. McLeod decided that the only option was to set up a defence position around the gatehouse to stop the Germans going towards the drop zone where the next wave of men were going to come in. From the top window of the gatehouse, he could see the defence position down there behind some barbed wire, but he couldn't make out where the gun was. As he and Lieutenant Walker were trying to ascertain where the gun was, the gun fired and hit the base of the tower with an enormous explosion and dust and uh, rubble flying all over the place. The cloud called on Corporal Eichel to come up and try and hit the gun with a piat. Now Eichel fired a shell towards the gun and it fell short. While Eichel was reloading, a 75mm shell ripped through the room. Eichel and Walker were killed instantly and Bismuta and uh, McLeod were badly wounded and they were going to die. And Private Thompson, who just came into the room, he thought he was okay until he saw half of his hand was missing. Just then they heard the throttling back of the C-47s and realised the next wave of paratroopers were coming in. Captain Hansen had just arrived to take command. A Corporal Hartington went along a ditch that went towards the gun and he used the mortar to fire four shells rapidly, horizontally, pitching the mortar against a tree. And then he fired a few smoke shells. Then he got out of the way quickly, expected the 75mm gun to fire at him. But then a white flag was shown and 43 Germans surrendered. So they'd finally overcome the German resistance here. With that track to the left of the trees was the old road. They came up here as a crossroads. This is about where the 75mm gun was firing at the Canadians. The Canadian monument in Varaville. The main text on the monument is in French, but it does say that there were 19 killed out of the Canadians, 10 wounded, 84 taken prisoner. Only 75 men of the 9th Battalion regained the bridge where they were to regroup. Lieutenant McGowan landed some way from the drop zone. On his way towards Varaville, he picked up quite a few men and decided to set up a defensive position around the church using the spire as an observation post. They were attacked by the Germans, they took some prisoners, then they were helped by the local population. Some women were tending the wounded and a Frenchman, who they gave a maroon berry to, actually shot three snipers. This is a bridge over the Divet. Divet's actually a parallel branch of the Dive, so it breaks off from the Dive and it joins up again. The other bridges they blew up were on the Dive, but the Dive here is another two miles further over, so blowing this bridge up was equally effective. So McLeod had sent Sergeant Davis and two men to blow this bridge, and around about 10 o'clock they heard an enormous explosion and all the Canadians in the town, at the church and at the chateau, they sent up a big cheer because they realised their mission, or the main mission, had been completed. So behind me is the bridge and the plaque commemorating the action. And looking the other way, we can see the spire of the church. That's where McGowan was centred, setting up his command uh, post and defence position. Lieutenant Toslan was heading towards Robon Bridge. He had 10 Canadian paratroopers with him and he picked up 10 British on the way. 
About two o'clock in the morning, they stopped a girl on a bike to ask them where they, they were. She took them across the field and showed them the, the bridge from further down the river. When they arrived at the bridge, Major Fuller was already there. He'd landed in the river and managed to get out. He and the men with him had no explosives, so they were just making sure no Germans could cross the bridge. Toseland collected as many gamma grenades as he could from the men and set these on the bridge girders. The resulting explosion damaged the bridge, but it was still up. But it did bring a group of men in with Captain Griffin. With Griffin in charge, Major Fuller set off for the Menil. Paratroopers could now set up a strong defence position on the bridge. Around 6 a.m. Captain Jack arrived from the Royal Engineers and he had enough explosive to blow the bridge up. So in 15 minutes he set the explosives and then he said to Captain Griffin, it's your bridge, would you like to blow it? So in a few minutes Captain Griffin had pushed the plunger and the bridge was exploded. These bridges that were exploded were replaced with Bailey bridges afterwards. Now this bridge looks like a Bailey bridge, but it isn't. There is a Bailey bridge at Carrington. A Bailey bridge, the bits are connected with spigots and it's not the same design. The Royal Engineers 3rd Parachute Squadron, led by Major Rosevier, were to land in drop zone K and supported by the Paros of 8th Battalion, were to blow up the bridges at Bure and Troan. As drop zone K wasn't marked by the Pathfinders, many men, including Rosevier, were dropped in drop zone N, a long way from Troan. Rosevier set off towards Troan on foot and collected other men on the way. They then met a group of eight paras and some medics in a jeep with a trailer. Rosevier turfed out the medics and filled the jeep and the trailer with his explosives and some men. He left some men to guard the crossroads and set off to Troan. Rosevier came down the road from Le Menil. He met this road that goes to Esqueville. Rosevier sent the main body of men, led by Captain Jukes, through the woods behind me, towards Bure, to blow up the two bridges. And with the rest of his men, he carried on down this road towards Troan. When they got to the level crossing near Troan, on the old station road, the jeep got entangled in barbed wire. This is where Rosevier got caught in the uh, barbed wire near the railway line near the station. The railway line's disappeared, the station's gone, there's houses here now. The noise they made while they're trying to get the jeep disentangled from the barbed wire woke up a guard and some men killed him by using their sten guns instead of a knife. So that noise woke up other guards. Then they had to go down the road behind me into Troan because there were other guards waking up and they would have carried on straight down this road. <coughs> they came down here, turned into the main street, throw on. The jeep was laden up with uh, one and a half tons of equipment plus the men who was doing a top speed of 35 miles an hour. And then they came to this brow here. So as the road started going down, the Jeep picked up speed. The trailer was swinging widely behind it and Sapper PT got thrown off, was taken prisoner by the Germans. And they carried on down here. Now there's a bridge over a stream here, but this is, isn't the one they blew up. So this is the bridge and they got to it. No guards on the bridge. Got to the bridge and it wasn't guarded. So the sappers quickly placed charges and very soon a 20 foot gap was blown in the bridge. Then they pushed the jeep into the river and set off on foot to their rendezvous point at Le Menil. Looking down the river from Troan, we can see Buell. That's where Jukes destroyed two bridges. Looking back from the bottom of the hill, 
This is the road gate they came down from Troan. This is the bridge that replaced the bridge that Captain Jukes blew up at Buell. He had a more relaxed time than Rosevere did. He even had time to allow the local farmer to bring his cattle across the bridge before they blew it up. Now from the road bridge at Buell, you couldn't see the railway bridge. It doesn't even exist now. But you can see a white building that's near where the railway bridge was. And you can see the level land by those poplar trees. That's where the railway line went. The motorway is just behind it now. From the road bridge at Buell, we can see Proan Church. Jukes reported to Lieutenant Colonel Pearson, the commander of 8th Battalion. Pearson had no news of Rosevere's success. Aware of the importance of Troan Bridge on the main road, he sent Captain Jukes to blow it up. This lane is now called Sixers June Street, and this is the lane that Jukes came down, coming towards Troan again, late after Rosevere. So you came down the lane there and they carried on down here towards the church. He left some men at the crossroads before the main road and they came under fire from Germans near the church but they took some prisoners. So getting into the main road they carried on down towards the bridges and when they got to the bridge they saw that Rosevere had made a gap of 20 foot, so he extended it to make a gap of 40 foot and then went back to their rendezvous. This is the crossroads at Menil. This was a rallying point for most of the paratroopers once they'd carried out their missions. So Lieutenant Otway came here, Rosevere came here, and Jukes. On the 28th of June, Jukes was supervising the building of a sandbag defence for the Canadians at Le Menil. A mortar fell near his jeep and he was mortally wounded. He's buried in Ranville Cemetery. The 5th Parachute Brigade, led by Brigadier Hill, was to land in Drop Zone N by Ranville. They were to back up the Ox and Bucks at Benneville and Ronville bridges and clear the zone for the gliders to come in at 3.20 plus the later wave at 2100 hours. There's a video of taken of Pegasus Bridge the Oxen Bucks took the bridge rapidly at midnight 20. They stopped an attack of four self-propelled guns with a single shot from a Piat. And the commandos arrived from Sword Beach at 5 past 12, five minutes late. There is of course more to the story than that. There always is. The 7th Parachute Battalion of the 5th Brigade relieved the Oxen Bucks at 3 o'clock. Lieutenant Colonel Pinecoffin, yes that was his name, set up defensive positions around Benneville and Le Port. Shortly after dawn, the Germans started raids against them with infantry and panzers. This is the entrance to the Chateau of Benneville near Pegasus Bridge. In 1944, they weren't in houses opposite, just hedges. A company of the 2nd Battalion of the 192nd Regiment of the 21st Panzers was sent from the south towards Benneville and Lieutenant Holler was sent along here by the wall to see if the way was clear. He got to the end of the wall here and he took out his camera and gave it to Sergeant Attender to take his photo. He wanted a souvenir of the invasion. Lieutenant Holler returned to Major Zip to report and Major Zip decided that without infantry support the half-tracks and self-propelled guns were too vulnerable to grenades so he spread the vehicles out south of Benneville to form a defence position. Now Sergeant Willis's platoon fired on the Germans and also naval gunfire broke up their formations. Dawn brought another problem, that of civilians fleeing the battle zone trying to get across the bridges. During the morning, Lieutenant Atkinson of C Company patrolled up to Benneville Chateau with nine paratroopers. He met Madame Villon, 
who ran the maternity hospital set up in the chateau. He said, where the British Army of Liberation? She looked at the ten men and said, what, all of you? She pointed out a German machine gun on the roof, which she'd already complained about, to the Germans. Well, the chateau was outside their defence perimeter, so Atkinson wasn't in a position to take any action. But a shell went through the chateau, and that convinced the Germans to retire. The shell was fired by Wally Parr, with the 50mm gun at the bridge. He didn't find out two years later that he'd fired at the maternity home when he read an article about it. Company B faced problems from Germans ensconced in the church tower. Corporal Killian got into the houses in the road opposite the church, broke through the thin interior walls to get to a position where he could fire Piat. That made a gaping hole in the church tower. A tank came along later on and made the hole even bigger. During the morning, Company A had to deal with attack snipers and Mark IV tanks coming from the west. One Mark IV was knocked out by Michael McGee putting a gamma grenade on the track. Two gunboats came up from Wistram and Howard's men fired a Piat and a Bren gun to sink one of them and the other one went back to Wistram. The commandos led by Lord Lovett had landed on Sword Beach at 7.30. They were supposed to arrive at the Beneville at 12 o'clock. They were five minutes late, but the 7th Battalion welcomed their opportune arrival. One of the men of the 7th Battalion was a certain Richard Todd. He was into acting before the war, but is most famous for his role as Major Howard in The Longest Day. This is the Chateau d'Homme at Ronville. This is where General Gale set up his headquarters. A panther attack was expected from the south towards Ronville. The 12th and 13th battalions had the responsibility of securing the zone. The strategic point was this summit. Holding a summit is useful, but when it's visible and can be fired on by the artillery. The reverse slope defence allows the summit to be defended whilst being hidden from the enemy. In 1944, the top of the hill had less trees on it, and here there were hedges and orchards. The main position of Company A and C was down by the stream near Ranville. Captain Sim was in the forward position by a hedge which came along here. He was with Lance Corporal Gleason and 12 other men. Around six o'clock, 200 Germans came over the brow of the hill over there, and Sim said to the men, hold your fire, so they're 50 metres away. He was just going to call for fire and the Germans went to ground and two self-propelled guns came over the brow. Now, as the Mauritius couldn't fire, that to uh, rely on the six pounders of the 4th Armoured Battalion. One of them was in the forward position with him. Now, as they were going to fire, they found the breach had jammed. They'd been damaged in the landing in the gliders. So, uh, Sim fired a flare towards the river to call for aid and he sent a runner to the headquarters. In a few minutes they'd taken heavy casualties and Sim, think most of his colleagues were dead, with a few men he went back to the C Company position near the stream. But Lance Corporal Gleason and Private Gradwell were still fighting. Then Corporal Gleason told Gradwell to retreat while he gave covering fire and then Gleason was going to follow him but he decided that the route that uh, Gradwell had taken had been taken too often, so he went a different way. He went across the fields towards the road, jumped in a ditch, and he was taken prisoner by Germans who were in the ditch. He was led up over the top of the brow of the hill and taken by a truck to St. Pierre sur Dive, which was the headquarters of the 21st Panzer Division. The self propelled guns were knocked out by six pounders but there were further counter-attacks. By 1900 hours, the third commando pushed the Germans back over the top of the hill and held the hill. This brings us to the end of the day of the 6th of June for the British and Canadian Airborne. There'd be another video about holding the, the ridge. There's the ridge that the Airborne were to hold for the next six weeks. Bavent Wood is to the right.